Yeah. Derek, thank you very much for coming. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. This is a great conference, a great opportunity for, for all of us to talk about a subject that probably has been rolling around in the back of our minds for a while, and we have now have a forum for it. I hope this thing, I'm very grateful that this happened after lunch, so it won't pick up my stomach growling. <laughs> so if you hear growling now, it's, it's another problem. No now. Yeah. So um, I'd like to say, first of all, that this, um, this uh, piece that I'm going to present is part of ongoing um, work that I presented an earlier version of in Istanbul in the ASPS conference uh, in September. And I've been trying to sort of rethink it, re-pivot this work around the issue of subalternity. Um, and, and I'd like to say that in, in the paper, um, um, I'm dealing with subalternity in a couple of different registers at, at once, um, in a kind of historiographical issues, um, a geographical kind of subalternity, as in Miklos's paper, um, and also a sort of actual one dealing with a, a group of, of people who might be construed as subalterns who um, arise out of that position, and that's in some ways it's that story. But I think we need to think of subalternity as a kind of relative or fluid category that, um, that it depends on all of the all of the um, the relationship between terms in the, in the in the group that you're studying. So I'll start um, giving the actual paper now. So um, between the mid 15th and mid 17th centuries of the Common Era. Three different historians of the city of Yazd each composed a history of his home city in Persian. The first, oh good, it's working. The first is Jafar ibn Muhammad Jafari's Tarikh Yazd, composed in the mid 15th century. The second is Ahmed Khatib's Tarikh Jadid Yazd, composed no later than 1467. And the last is Muhammad Mufid Mustafi's Jami e Mufidi, completed it in, in 1679 and dedicated to the reigning Safavid monarch, Shah Suleiman. Although greatly varied in length and in content, each author narrated the history of the city from its origins in the ancient past to his own present time. These authors allotted much space to the events in Yaz during the Ilkhanid era, and although they were written long afterward, they presented this period as being especially transformational for the city. In fact, as we'll see, it was during this era that they located the origins of their current order. The most famous Persian histories of the Ilkhanid period written by Juvaini, Rashid al-Din, Masaf, Mustafi, and Qashani, as well as some less studied ones, such as Shaban Kera'is, have provided us with a rich picture of the Ilkhan's history and policies. But while, but while each of these touch on the happenings of provincial cities like Yazd, accounts of these places are generally incidental to the larger narrative, which is centered on the figures of the court. The Yazdi sources, which are focused on the history of a single region, can help us fill in some of the gaps and allow us to observe more closely the Ilkhanid processes of acculturation as it played out on the ground in a provincial center of the realm. Okay. At the same time, though penned by elites, the local histories of Yazd present us with a kind of subaltern perspective, allowing us to explore the ways in which Yazdis actively negotiated their own place in the Mongol dispensation by establishing social networks with the elites at the court. Even so, I'm more interested here in exploring the ways in which, in their writings, Yazd's historians commemorated this legacy of engagement during the Ilkhanid period, generations after the fact. I will argue that the Yazdi historians crafted artful accounts of this period of engagement and refining the strategies of political engagement that their predecessors had developed to interact with the Ilkhans and rise to prominence in the empire, use them to negotiate the city's place in the imperial systems of their own uh, eras. So Yazd had a unique relationship with the Ilkhanid court, an arrangement that resulted largely from the machinations of the famous Rashid al-Din, the grand vizier and renowned uh, physician, who introduced important reforms during Ghazan Khan's reign and composed the voluminous history Jame Tabarikh. As we will discover, the Yazdi historians were quite focused on this figure's relationship with their home city. And for this reason, the study must start by exploring just what Rashid al-Din had to do with Yazd. To begin with, the Ilkhanid era sources demonstrate that Rashid al-Din had a deep financial investment in the city of Yazd. And a look at Rashid al-Din's own Vakhname shows that he had endowed extensive properties for you know, his complex in Tabriz. <clears throat> Um, if I 
said that his own complex, he endowed extensive properties in Yazd for his own complex in, in Tabriz. But in addition to the vizier's well-documented material interest in Yazd, the Yazdi historians relate that the powerful Rashid ad-Din had a personal interest in that city too and had con cultivated human connections there. The Yazdi historians relate that in his early years, maybe even before he converted to Islam from Judaism, Rashid ad-Din had sojourned in Yazd in order to study medicine with one of the great Sayyids of the Razi family, Sharaf ad-Din Ali. Later, in honor of his former teacher, he built a madrasa in Yazd called the Rashidiya. Rashid ad-Din and his son, Qiyas ad-Din, who also rose to his father's rank of Grand Vizier, forged marriage alliances with the Yazdi Sayyid families, and I'll talk about those later. As a consequence of this entanglement with Yaz society and buildings, the Yazdis provided father and son with a substantial biographical notice in their local histories as honorary townsmen. The Mongols had long attracted men like Rashid ad-Din to court, who were from notable Tajik families of the illiterate and religious classes of the provincial centers. However, by the late 13th and early 14th centuries, the Ilkhans increasingly involved them uh, increasingly involved themselves in the affairs of provincial cities and reached out to notables based there. Tajiks like Rashid ad-Din, who had already attained positions at the Imperial Diwan, functioned as intermediaries and brokered new ties between the Mongol elites and the intellectual and spiritual powerhouses that were rooted in towns across the realm. The economic and professional ties with Yazd that helped Rashid ad-Din and his son build their wealth, prestige, and political careers also served this interest of their imperial masters, who sought to bring the leadership of the provincial cities like Yazd closer to them. As will become clear below, in the case of Yazd, local Sayyids became instrumental in the Mongols' move to undermine defiant local military households, which had long possessed political power in the region. These were the Atabegs, who had been local mainstays of the Seljukid order, but who had ruled locally with a great deal of, of autonomy. Now, the Tajik ministers of the center didn't always support the Sayyids of provincial towns across the realm as they did in Yazd, or as they would in Yazd. There are counterexamples. In one case described by Rashid ad-Din's rival Qashani in his history of Ujaytu's reign, Rashid ad-Din actually opposed a powerful Shiite Sayyid, Tajuddin al-Vaji, a close associate of one of his uh, main rivals, the minister Sa'ad uh, ad-Din Salvaji. Uh, Taj ad-Din had gained control of the shrine of one of the Jewish prophets, Zul Kifl, near, near Al-Hilla, and much to the chagrin of the Jewish community there, built a mihrab minbar and minaret there. In the end, Rashid ad-Din schemed to rile up the local Sayyids there uh, against Sayyid Taj ad-Din, and after the locals complained to Uljaitu about him, Rashid ad-Din presented the Padishah with a copy of Ta Taj ad-Din's Nasab Nameh, which he had personally doctored making it look as though the Sayyid had faked his own Alid lineage, and the Padishah, the Padishah faced with uh, rather incontrovertible evidence of the Sayyid Taj ad-Din's supposed act of fraud, ordered him executed in 1312. So clearly not all Sayyid families fared as well as Yazd's would, and Rashid ad-Din's decision to favor some Sayyids over others must be understood in the context of his larger program of real politique. Nevertheless, overall, the administrators of the Mongol center increasingly built relationships directly with local Sayyid families and inserted themselves into their local affairs. Uh, moreover, the, the chronicles that these same men penned demonstrate a profound interest in these relationships, whether they were amiable or, or antagonistic. So with regard to Yazd, Rashid ad-Din's uh, Rashid ad-Din and his son, Riyas ad-Din, were perfectly positioned to broker a sort of harmonious association between the center and the city's Sayyid families, and to increase those figures' local authority at the expense of the local Atabegs. However, the Yazdi historians compressed what was in fact a rather gradual set of political and social transformations into a single, rather curious narrative of events concerning one of these Sayyid families, the Nizam clan, to which the Ilkhanid viziers would establish close ties. This narrative will form the core of the rest of this talk, and its analysis will help us better understand some of the strategies with which the Mongol and Yazdi elites interacted with one another. Now, the Nizam family constituted one of the illustrious Husseini Sayyid lineages of Yazd, that of the Arizi Sayyids. And I've already mentioned another clan from this lineage, the Razi family, with whom Rashid ad-Din had studied medicine. <clears throat> 
Before the events of the narrative in question, the Nizams and their cousins had remained rather simply local authorities. And by the late 13th, early 14th century, however, the situation would change under the leadership of a certain Sayyid Ruknadin Muhammad and his son uh, Shamsuddin Muhammad. And these two will be the main protagonists of the, of the story. The key event in these Sayyid's biographies concerns the construction of a new madrasa complex in the center of the city. The new site was situated directly beside the Madrasa Ya Mahmud Shahi, named for the building's founder, Mahmud Shah, one of the early Atabegs who had ruled Yazd since the era of the great Saljuks, and whose descendants had continued to govern the city. In the Yazdi historian's retelling, a conflict over the city skyline between Sayyid Ruknadin and the sitting Atabeg called Yusuf Shah triggered an outbreak of fitna and ultimately a political reconfiguration in the city. This story of the madrasa, known as the Rukniya madrasa, is unique to Yazdi histories and unfolds as follows. When the Atabeg Yusuf Shah learns of Sayyid Ruknadin's decision to build in the city center, he interprets the move as an affront to his own family's dignity and authority and immediately formulates a plot to discredit the Sayyid and ruin him. The Atabeg seizes the opportunity to implicate Ruknadin in the recent murder of a wealthy Christian merchant. And after a sham trial, he has the Sayyid publicly tortured and tosses him into a dungeon. Next, the Atabeg trains his eye on Ruknadin's son and successor, the 14-year-old Sayyid Shamsuddin Muhammad, who has been hiding at the home of a loyal friend. At this point, the narrative slips into a more hagiographical register. The Prophet Muhammad appears in a dream to another devotee of Sayyid Ruknadin, explaining where Shamsuddin is hiding and instructing him to ferret the boy out of the city so that he can make his way to the Ilkhanid capital of Tabriz for help. The man does as the Prophet instructs him, and the young Shamsuddin sets off through the desert. Now, after a miracle saves the boy from death by dehydration along the way, we are told that he arrives in Tabriz, the capital of the Ilkhan, Abu Said. The scene changes abruptly, and we're taken into the bedchamber of the Padishah's Grand Vizier, Qiyasuddin Muhammad, that is, the son of Rashid al-Din. There, the Prophet visits the Vizier in a dream, introduces him to Sayyid Shamsuddin Muhammad, and requests that Qiyasuddin bring him before the Padishah to ask for help. The Vizier wakes up, locates Shamsuddin Muhammad, and brings him before Abu Said. The boy convinces the sovereign of Atabeg Yusuf Shah's villainy and the innocence of his own father, and Abu Sayyid then dispatches an Ilchi to Yazd to free the Sayyid. Before giving us this segment of the story in detail, however, the texts explain that a close relationship, meanwhile, develops between the Vizier Qiyasuddin and Shams Muhammad, uh, sorry, Shamsuddin Muhammad. We learn that Shamsuddin receives a robe of honor and the post of Sadrate Mamalik, a rather elusive title. However, the vizier gives Shamsuddin his sister in marriage. The narrative then returns to Yazd, and the Ilkhan's envoy arrives and dispatches a band of men to break Ruknidin out. And at this moment, we encounter another miracle. When the Khan's soldiers peer into the chamber, they find Ruknidin Muhammad protected by a venomous asp, neatly coiled upon the hem of the Sayyid's skirt. The, the serpent, recognizing these men as Ruknidin's defenders, vanishes at the moment they enter the cell, allowing them to escort the Sayyid back to the city where he is welcomed in celebration by the population. The envoy installs Ruknuddin Muhammad as the chief Khadi of the city, and the Sayyid forgives his former adversaries and returns the city to its former state of peace. And there's no mention here of the Atabeg's fate. He just falls away from the story. The biography concludes with the Sayyid's death and burial at the Madrasa, the Rukniya Madrasa, but first describes a number of his other major construction projects throughout the city and throughout the realm at large. The focus, though, is on a new canal, which Said Ruknadin ordered to shuttle fresh mountain water from Farasha, a village on the south side of the city, which features a Qadamga, to the key religious complexes in the city center, including the Rukniya and the Congregational Mosque. Along the way, the Sayyid also channels this stream to the Rashidiyya, which, as we have already learned, Rashid al-Din had constructed earlier in honor of his teacher from the, from the Razi family. Immediately thereafter, the histories describe the building project of Ruknuddin's son, Shams al-Din uh, Muhammad, that's who is, he built the Shamsiya complex uh, in the city. And Shams al-Din is now the son-in-law of Rashid al-Din and the Sadarate Memalik. 
Furthermore, all the Yazdi accounts relate that the mausoleums of the Rukhniya and Shamsiya madrasa complexes both served as places of ziyarat, even up to Mufid's day in the 17th century. Meanwhile, we also discover that Rukhniddin, uh, Rukhniddin married one of his daughters, uh, Rukhniddin Muhammad married one of his daughters to the son of Sharafuddin Ali Razi, the man who had been Rashiduddin's teacher of medicine. Okay. Sayyid Shamsuddin's biography closes with the mention of the marriage of his daughter, Ismat Din Arslan Khatun, to yet another illustrious Sayyid, Mu'idin Ashraf, who belonged to a third branch of the Arizi family. Okay. So Shamsuddin's wife, i.e. the mother of this girl, was Rashiduddin's own daughter. Thus, by the end of the notices on this father and son, the Yazdi authors neatly tie these various Sayyid family lines to one another. But in doing so, they also tied these families to the great Viziri family of the Yakhanid capital. Moreover, they present this new patronage network as being materialized in the new urban landscape of the city, a set of madrasa complexes and Husseini shrines connected by a new canal. The importance of both these new complexes and the new relationships between Yaz Sayyids and the imperial center would increase over the next two centuries. So what's the moral of this story? Well, Yazd came to pro prominence because of the blessed Sayyids, whose knowledge, justice, and piety allowed them to develop their home cities in ways that the Atabag rulers could not, and through the miraculous intercession of the Prophet himself, managed to solidify close relationships with members of the imperial court. Set to paper for the first time over a century after the events in question, that is, after the prominence of Yaz Sayyid families in the empire were already established, this hagiographical narrative represents an obvious compression of a more complicated transformation in relationships between the notable Sayyid families of Yazd, their local governors, and their imperial overlords. There are certain hiccups in this neat little story that give clues about what the Yazdis obscure and why. The first indication that there might be something suspicious about the Yazdi narrative is that the fate of Atabeg Yusuf Shah, who is supposedly the ringleader of the whole conspiracy, conspicuously drops out at the conclusion of the story. Moreover, it turns out that there are two contradictory stories about Yusuf Shah in the Yazdi histories. The first, which revolves around the Rukhniya Madrasa, has just been recounted. But in a separate section of these works, the Yazdi histories rehearse a full account of the Atapeg's reign in chronological fashion. This is in a whole different section of, of the works, where they detail the, the, the Atapeg's eventual collapse during Yusuf Shah's reign. However, these accounts narrate a completely different story about Yusuf Shah that does not square well with this one about the Rukhniya Madrasa. In fact, the Nizam clan doesn't even come up in this second Yusuf Shah story. It turns out that the second account actually corresponds with the rather fragmentary accounts of the Atabeg's fall that appear in the earlier chronicles of Rashid ad-Din, Wasaf, and Shaban Karai, albeit with some variations. There is no trace of the Rukhniya story in any of these either. When we place the second rendition of the Yusuf Shah story in the Yazdi histories, i.e. the ones without the Rukhniya madrasa, when we put these into dialogue with the Ilkhanid sources, we discover, first of all, that the chronologies of the Atabeg dynasty's succession is a mess. No two works agree, and in fact, there are internal consistencies in most of them. But when we compare the various accounts of Yusuf Shah's reign itself, we discover essentially the same basic narrative in all the sources, that is, in the Yazdi sources, the second rendition of the Yazdi sources, and in the Ilkhanid era sources. Essentially, these all revolve around Atabeg, uh, the Atabeg Yusuf Shah's failure to send tribute to the Ilkhanid court. Yusuf Shah flees after butchering the Mongol emir dispatched to force tribute, and the Mongols appoint a Duruga over Yazd, thus bringing an end to Atabeg rule. Most likely, the Yazdis, writing later, borrowed this narrative from their predecessors. So two completely different narratives uh, encapsulated in the Yazdi sources. This one probably taken from the Ilkhanid ones. This one doesn't appear anywhere else. All the sources, including the Yazdi ones, set these events uh, in the second narrative. They set these events during the reign of Ghazan, or Argun. Now, we should recall that the other Yazdi story of Said Rukhnadin and the tyrannical Atabeg Yusuf Shah examined above was set during Abu Said's reign, a good two decades later. 
This means that the Yazdi histories contain two completely different stories about Yusuf Shah and the end of the Atabeg dynasty set at two different times. Now, there's a possible explanation for this inconsistency, and it comes in a Timurid era source on the history of the Muzaffarids, Qutbi's reworking of Mu'in ad-Din Yazdi's Tariq Ali Muzaffar. Um, this man is mentioned earlier. He was the one that married the daughter of Shams ad-Din. Okay? It's related that at the beginning of Abu Sayyid's reign, a son of Yusuf Shah's, called Haji Shah ibn Yusuf Shah, mentioned uh, this was characters unmentioned in the Yaz Yazdi sources, was appointed to govern Yazd sometime after the ousting of his father during Hazan Khan's reign, and was then quickly overthrown by local leaders. So it appears that the Yazdis had collapsed this pair, father and son, into a single ill-fated figure. But why did the Yazdi historians conflate these two men? Writing over a century after the events in question, these authors, who came from Yazd's scribal class, had benefited from the Arizi Sayyid's collaboration with, with Rashid ad-Din's family and the Ilkhans. As is well known, under the later dynasties, the descendants of these Sayyids had become highly influential at court and were now in prominent positions. I suggest that defending their elevated position against competitors from other regions required that their preeminence could be traced to a clear moralistic narrative about, um, forgive me, embattled subalterns just rising to elevated rank. At the same time, this was a foundation myth that tied a saintly progenitor to the imperial court. Indeed, the prophet himself had sanctioned their authority. But the presentation of such a hero required pairing with a foil, a villain who was locally tyrannous, disloyal to the ruling empire, and disdainful of the prophet's progeny. However, the second narrative about Yusuf Shah belies the existence of a more complex relationship between the Atabegs and the agents of the royal court than the simple one that the Yazdis present in the first story that, that villainizes him. In that narrative, as well as in Rashid ad-Din and his contemporaries' works, the Atabeg is a rebel, but he's by no means the fiend he is in the Rukhniya story. Even more revealingly, a document, although probably falsely attributed to Rashid ad-Din's household, that lists the marriages of his sons to his daughters. Uh, sorry, that's absolutely not what he was doing. That, uh, <laughs> uh, although Qashani might have portrayed it that way. Uh, that, 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 that lists the marriages of his sons to the daughters of princes around the world explains that Rashid ad-Din actually arranged a marriage between one of his sons to Yusuf Shah's niece. Um, this would mean, OK, that was supposed to happen earlier. There we go. He arranged um, 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 a marriage between one of his sons to Yusuf Shah's niece. <clears throat> this would mean that Rashid ad-Din's other son, Qiyas ad-Din, who was one of the heroes of the Rukhniya story and rival of Yusuf Shah, was actually tied by marriage to both Rukhni ad-Din's family and the Atabeg family. So while it is true that the Ilkhans ultimately unseated the Atabegs and enabled the Sayyids to rise to greatness, the real story was too complex for the history of the Yazdi historians, um, too complex for the history that they required of their works. They needed to present Rashid ad-Din's family as partners against a mutual foe who was absolutely evil. So the Yazdi historians capitalized on local strands of history, sensationalizing well-known stories about the last, or actually penultimate, Atabeg, which featured Yusuf Shah's rebellion against the Ilkhanid state and transplanted the villain from those stories into another story about a local rivalry between the Sayyids and the Atabegs of Yazd, probably Yusuf Shah's um, son, Haji Shah. This was likely a common saint's tale that initially circulated to explain the sacred origins of the Rukhniya Madrasa, which by the late 14th century had become an important site of Ziyara. By collapsing these disparate narratives into one, the Yazdi succeeded in legitimizing the religious authority of Yaz Sayyids while simultaneously portraying them as trusty servants of the imperial order, originally under the Ilkhans, but more importantly, under the empires that followed them. It was the newly powerful uh, madrasa and shrine complexes like the Rukhniya, connected as they were to patronage circles at the imperial court, that not only reoriented the ritual and economic life of the city, but also facilitated the training of Yazdis in fields like medicine and astrology so that they could rise to prominence at the imperial court as physicians, astrologers, and historians. 
The most famous of these is Sharaf al-Din Ali Yazdi, who was himself a great-great-grandson of Rukn al-Din and Sharaf al-Din Ali Razi, okay? and an architect of the Timurid imperial legacy uh, in his Zafarname and other texts. By the, time the Yazdi histori- uh, by the time the Yazdi historians were putting pen to paper, Yaz Sayyids had long served in elite posts, but they did so in increasingly competitive environments, where, c- where claiming association with saintly, especially Alid lineage, served as a key strategy for political promotion. Now, I suggest that it is against this backdrop, this competitive backdrop, that we must read the Yazdi historian's choice to implot the rise of the Sayyids from subalternity to preeminence in the form of uh, moralistic hagiography. And I'll stop there. This is apparently. <laughs> in the U- in, I've noticed in the UK people post the words thank you. So, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. We have time for questions. Robert. This touches on subalternity. Uh, the touches is good. Yes, I think there's a there's a clue in the architecture of these buildings to to what you're saying. If you look at uh, Ilkhanid architecture across Iran, it's almost always built of baked brick, mm. which is expensive. And in the first forty years of the fourteenth century, uh, that doesn't occur in Yazd outside. Ah the Friday Mosque. So the um, Ruknadin, the the Rukhniya, the Shamsiya, are built of mud brick, Ah. which means they're dead cheap. Uh And in order to make a dead cheap building look good, you've got to do something to it. And uh, you give it a veneer. Yeah, it's a plaster veneer. And the plaster veneer can be treated in a cheap way or it can be treated in an expensive way. The cheap way is in the Rukhniya, uh-huh. which is the earlier one, yeah. and they just lash paint on it. Uh-huh. It now looks um, desiccated, uh, crumbly, dilapidated, because that is the fate of untreated plaster. Uh-huh. Uh, the Shamsiya uh, attracted quite a bit more money and was decorated, is still decorated, in carved stucco, Uh which is also painted. So between father and son, they're upping the ante. But they're still in the the loser brigade, so far far as the architecture of the time is concerned. Uh And one last thing is that the plan of the Shamsiya yeah. was sent, and th- this is of interest to historians of architecture, yeah. um, the, the, the plan of it was sent from Tabriz. Yes. I, you probably know that. Yeah. And it's mentioned in the, in the local histories, actually. That's yeah. right. Now, now, that's a very, very unusual thing to do. And it suggests a certain incapacity on the part of the local people. Uh-huh. That they need to, they actually need to go, you know, it's like someone in Edinburgh sending off to London saying, how do I build one of these things? Can you, can you send me a ground plan? It's extraordinary. Yeah. That's, that, that's extremely uh, helpful for me. I'm, 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 I'm glad that you, you brought that up because I, I need to follow up the actual um, look of the buildings. I mean, that's something I haven't really dealt with here. And I know Susan has been telling me this for a long time. And if you look at the rest of the, if you look at the rest of the buildings uh, in Yazd of this period, Husseini Hasht, for instance, or Zandani Iskandar, they're all in this, in, in this really low-grade uh, mud brick, sometimes even stamped earth, for goodness sake, uh-huh. with, a, with a plaster coating and some paint. Yeah, they're quite disappointing looking from the inside. So. <laughs> they look damn good when they were brand new. <laughs> I'm, sure. I'm sure. So uh, that's very, very helpful. Thanks. And, and, and um, I think there's, there's no reason to add anything to what you just said. It just helps, helps me immensely. So, so thank you. Uh, oh, although I will say that, um, uh, that I believe that, um, if I remember correctly, Shams din really didn't live in Yazd again after this, uh, after this thing. I mean, he, he remained in Tabriz. And his, his body was transported. His wife had his body transported and placed there. Uh, and that's discussed in the, in the local histories, too. So he actually was, 
he had it built from afar. Did you want to? Thank you. To follow up on what uh, Robert said, uh, it's it, that that model you uh, established between center periphery, in a way, is really what is uh, emphasized in the way in which patronage of architecture seems to be working out as well. Whether the plan was actually sent from Tabriz or not, I assume is not absolute, right? That's not a knowledge that, am I right, Robert? It's, no, it's, it, it's, it's in the text of the... Yeah, but what I mean is that it could be um, a, a, another example of how they relate yeah. to that central... Oh, right, right, yeah. It's, that yeah, it's not real, but it has to be connected in order to, to create this narrative in, right. in, from multiple angles. So on that level, I think you really have, in fact, in the architectural patronage, yeah. further support for the arguments you're making. Yeah, it would be, thank you, it would be great if we knew what the Rashidia looked like. To, I mean, that, and that one would have been earlier and, you know, Rashid Adin's own thing, but, but there's no trace of it. And in fact, if I remember, now I've gotten myself um, confused, but if I, if I remember correctly, it's not, it is not mentioned in in the um, Safavid era, local history, because it, I, um, Mufid didn't know anything about it, or um, you know, obviously he'd read the earlier works, but he didn't know what it looked like, or, or maybe even where it was. Um, but it's mentioned in the earlier ones, and, and we just don't we just don't know what it looked like. But that would be really interesting. But also, I think other uh, local responses to the center. You can look at Pirbakron, for instance, to see how these sort of scaling uh -huh. of value might work vis-a-vis -a, -vis a center. Right. Um, that, that seems to me to be somewhat, I don't remember if Pibacron entirely uh, matches your mm. uh, Yazd examples, but mm. I, I think it's worth looking at just a comparison of yeah. how does this fit into a context of center periphery and, and patronage. Yeah, uh, and, and let me just say there that um, Oh, now I lost it. It'll come back. Just give me two seconds. Um, oh, yes, uh, there's a tendency to, uh, to um, be bedazzled by the way the local historians describe these places, and talk about you know the dome is as lofty as the sky and all. But from what you're saying, yeah, and actually when you look at what these, these places look like, they're, they're not so lofty and they're not so, ama they're not so amazing. So. Um, we can be tricked by, by the local sources, which is a problem with local histories in general. They're always... Or written material in general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Okay, uh, coffee is already here, I understand. So uh, we'll take a break. Um, sorry. Coffee is already here, we'll take a break until uh, our time here in um, Scotland at, th uh, sorry, 3.30, uh, sorry, 4.30. Yeah, there we go, got a lot of, that clock hasn't been changed, so it's still an hour off, so. Thank you very much, Thank and again, Daryl. Thank you. Thank you.